Hello, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to the First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. Whether you're in person in the sanctuary, whether you're joining us online, whether you've been here a million times or this is your first time, I am so thankful that you have joined us today. My name is Lance Marshall. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. Dr. Brewster normally speaks during this service. He's enjoying uh, some time of relaxation this morning, so I'm happy to bring the message today. And before I do, we have some special announcements I want to share. One, we're of course so excited to be able to do some in-person worship now. And in consultation with doctors and public health experts, what they've told us the safest thing to do is to make sure that our singers are both wearing masks and located behind plexiglass. So you'll see that that's the case. Uh, all of us are going to be wearing our masks during the entire service including speakers. When we're not speaking, we're going to have our masks on. If you're at home, we encourage you to sing along to the hymns and songs very loudly. Uh, if you're in person, you can join me in humming. So we're going to keep uh, the singing to a minimum because that's a very efficient way of spreading the virus. One of the things I also want to pay, call your attention to is that we are doing a touchless bulletin. We're not handing out bulletins, but we do have in the seats when you sat down today, a little card. It's got the Lord's Prayer and the Affirmation of Faith on it. It also has a QR code. If you choose, you can take a picture of that funny looking box with the camera app on your phone and that should automatically open a link to a normal bulletin. So have all the information you would typically find in the bulletin. I want to let you know that when we have calls and response or things like that, they are going to be on the screen for those of you who are located here in the sanctuary or on your screen for those of you who are worshiping from home. What I also want to invite you to do, particularly if you're worshiping from home, is join us in making this a sacred space. Light a candle, shut off some of the distractions, and as we all together come together to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. In your sacred space at home and in this sacred space here in the sanctuary, I invite everyone to stand for the call to worship. Uh, and as Lance said, you do have words on the screen. The response is really easy today. Same thing each time, seven words. We come to worship one holy God. So here we go. Gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and blessed by God, we come to worship one holy God. O oh God, our own God, how wonderful is your name in all the earth. We come to worship one holy God. Your majesty is the music of the starry skies, yet even children of dust 
can sing your praises. We come to worship one holy God. standing as we affirm our faith together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and to serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life and death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Joshua, chapter 24, verses 14 through 15, and 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, 13 through 18. Hear these words. Now therefore we revere the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. Now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, Choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods choose this day, whether your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or your ancestors served in the region, in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, but as for one in my household, we will serve the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we want you to know about people who have died so that you won't mourn others like others who don't have any hope. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose, so we also believe that God will bring with him those who had died in Jesus. What we are saying is a message from the Lord. We who are alive and still around at the Lord's coming definitely won't go ahead of those who have died. This is because the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a signal of a shout by the head angel and a blast on God's trumpet. First, those who are dead in Christ will rise. 
Then we who are living and still around will be taken up together with them in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air. That way we will always be with the Lord. So encourage each other with these words. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, friends. I thought today we would have a little fun with Venn diagrams. Everybody go, ooh. So a Venn diagram, kids, it's pretty simple, really. What we do is you, you have circles, two or more circles, and the circles represent something, or they stand for something. So let's have these circles be my shoes. And you'll see I've got a blue shoe on this side and a red shoe on this side. So this is how they're different. This will be the red shoe side and the blue shoe side. They're also different, and then this is my left. I think, yeah, that's my left and that's my right. So that's how they're different. But it's not really a Venn diagram yet. It's just circles that are separate. What makes it interesting, what makes it fun, what makes it a Venn diagram is when the circles overlap and you see that, that space right there, that's where we think about all the things that these two shoes share. First of all, they're shoes, duh, right? They have that in common. They uh, also have laces. And those laces are currently tied, not always a guarantee with Mr. Mark's shoes. Uh, they all need a little bit of cleaning. So look at that. Look at all those things that those two shoes share. Now, they're different shoes, right? The circles are still different, but there's a lot that those two shoes share in common. It's easy to do a Venn diagram with shoes. It's harder to do it with people, but we're going to try. So let's imagine that this circle is a country music fan and this circle is a rock and roll fan. What do you mean you like rock and roll? What do you mean you like country music? That's not real music. It sure is. All rock and roll is is a bunch of distortion pedals and ooh, baby, baby. And country music, at least it's authentic. Authentic? You mean all the songs about tractors and dirt roads? Well, you live in Tanglewood. What are you, who are you trying to kid with your authenticity? Now there's something in our world that loves it when these two circles are separate and they're constantly going at each other about what's different. But there's that whisper, that wonderful whisper of the voice of Jesus that tries to pull these circles and to show the overlap. So you're saying you both like music. Well, yeah. And you're saying you like music so much that it really touches something in you in your heart. Well, yes. Huh. Looks like you might have something in common there. Do you think maybe there might be some music? You, like rock and roll guy, do you think you might give Johnny Cash a try? Well, maybe. And country guy, you think you might give Nathaniel Rateliff and the Night Sweats a try? I've never heard of him, but maybe. And maybe both of you might like the Eagles a little bit. Okay. Let's try another one. So, and this actually true story. A couple of my friends who I saw on Facebook a few weeks ago, a brother and a sister, started a lemonade stand so that they could raise some money for the African Orphan Endeavor, which our church supports, so that kids in Kenya can go to school, which is a really important thing. And another child, and I'm wearing it right here, made a bunch of lanyards, you know, so we can all keep up with our masks. And she made so much money that she wanted to donate a lot of that money to our church's First Street Methodist Mission. Well, but what about the, the children in Kenya? They need so much. But there we have children in our own backyard who need help. And there's something in the world that would love it if those two sides just kept fighting with each other. But not Jesus. Jesus says... So what you're saying is, you both think it's important to take care of other people. Yes. You both see the needs of other people and know that you have enough blessings that you can share. Yes. Well, I would say you've got a lot in common. And that's what it really is. It's common ground. It's not middle ground, right? Middle ground is when you start with a circle over here and you start with a circle over there and each side has to give up something. Each side feels like they lose a little bit so they can ha have that tension right there in the middle. But that's not Jesus' way. Jesus' way is that common ground. Start with the heart. Start 
at the core. Let's, let me just ask right here, right now, let's try this. Who here, and raise your hands, who here really loves Jesus? Raise your hand if you love Jesus. Great, unanimous, I was hoping for that. Who here really loves our country? Who here loves your family very much? Who here loves other families very much? Who here and at home, with a couple of weeks to go before Thanksgiving, knows something right now you are very thankful for? Who believes with all your heart that we have a responsibility to leave God's world a little bit better than we found it? Friends, what a blessing that we have that much common ground. May we always start with our common ground. Amen. Since my husband Lowell and I grew up in the Methodist Church, we looked for another one to attend in Fort Worth. We were fortunate to select First Church and become acquainted with Dr. Lamar Smith, who married us in 1966. I am now honored to be called one of Lamar's brides and feel blessed to see him in our service today. Our son Mike was baptized by Dr. Gaston Foote and confirmed with the youth and became an active participant in the activities of the church during his teen years. Through the years, we have found that the ministers are only a phone call away when an emergency arises and prayers and comfort are needed at any hour. Although we have a large congregation, the personal relationships with the ministers have made a significant difference in our faith. Becoming involved in the Loyalty Sunday School class gave us the opportunity to build friendships with those who share our beliefs. We have found that the fellowship and support of our class strengthens our commitment and involvement with the church. One of the most meaningful things that has occurred as a result of the pandemic is that our Sunday School class of about 75 has gotten better acquainted through Zoom. Thanks to Jack Benson, who reached out in late March to a church staff member who then assisted us in setting up virtual classes through the church at our usual 930 time. These virtual meetings have allowed us to bring speakers not only from Fort Worth, but from all over the country who stimulate thoughtful conversations. We have added an additional virtual social meeting during the week allowing us to interact with each other on a personal level in support of each other. Both of these meetings average between 20 and 60 attendees each week. Lowell and I have faithfully streamed the sanctuary service each Sunday morning following our virtual Sunday School class in the comfort of our living room. Being able to share in the worship service in this manner has been very important during these challenging times. However, we are pleased to be able to attend in person in a safe manner today. Our church has made a significant difference to those in our community who have suffered the most from this pandemic. It is more important than ever that we continue our commitment to give our share to the church. We are grateful to be able to support First Church and once again to return our 2021 commitment card and encourage you to join us as we strive to be God's people in the world. Thank you. Catherine Bryan, thank you so much for your warm invitational word to us. And thanks to everyone. Good to see you today here in the sanctuary, in your homes. My goodness, for everybody in your homes, for being part of the live stream today, thank you so much for letting us know that you're with us today, registering your attendance, offering prayer requests, making your offerings, all those things we're so grateful for. Uh, Many of you are on Facebook Live right now, so we want you to know that both Donna Smith and Mr. Mark are ready and willing and waving and chatting and they would love to visit with you today. So 
look for them. Uh, also, I want all of you to look for Reverend Phyllis Barron because she's going to be doing the invitation at the end of the service. And her phrase that pays this morning is worship plus one. Listen for it, worship plus one. Okay. I don't have circles, I sure liked them, but I've got a box. Here is the official Advent wreath box. Now, friends in the sanctuary, if you have a box with you, would you hold it up, show it to one another? The boxes are present, oh look. Everybody in the sanctuary will be able to take this box home to be prepared for the season of Advent and doing your wreath. Friends at home, you can, co you can come get a box today. From noon to one o'clock, you can come to the West parking lot and someone will give you a box in the most safe, caring way. And that will continue on Sundays throughout this month. So use this look forward to celebrating Advent with all the different trappings that we love. Now, two quick reminders. One is, every Wednesday evening, kind of in the category of what Catherine was talking about with the loyalty class and how they've embraced Zoom and staying together, we do that on Wednesday evenings as a church. And all church Bible study, it's called Grow. It's from 6.30 to 7.30. About a dozen people come and they're here in the building in room 350. And then when you sign up on our homepage, you'll be given a link so that you can be part of that Bible study. There's a large group session, Zoom small groups. Uh, it is so much fun and it has been a great way to stay connected. So I invite you uh, to that. Also, I want to remind you that the uh, presentation for All Saints Sunday last week called God Remembers, which is beautiful, please know that it's available to you on demand. Just go to the homepage of our website and you can enjoy the music and the devotional messages as often as you wish during this season. And speaking of as often as you wish, thank you for your generosity. Because as we enjoy the offertory here in a moment, thank you for all the ways that you make a difference through your prayers, your presence, your financial gifts, your service, and your witness. Thanks be to God for you.
Amen. Amen. Thank you. And welcome to everyone who's here uh, in person on 5th Street. Welcome to the First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. To all of you who have joined us and worshiped online, uh, I'm so thankful that you are with us as well. Before we consider today's scripture readings and today's message, I want to thank our incredible musicians for sharing us their gifts and leading us with worship. I want to thank all the tech folks on the cameras and the lights and the, and the internet boxes and all of y'all for making worship possible. Thank you. I want to thank all the people who've been hosting and greeting and helping manage everyone getting in and out safely. I want to thank all the leaders of the church who've dedicated hundreds of hours into researching and devising ways for us to worship in person safely. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so glad to be with you. If we haven't met before, uh, if this is your first time here, or if you've only been coming to this church for the last month, we may not have met. My name is Lance Marshall. I am one of the pastors here at FUMC Fort Worth, and I have been out on something called renewal leave. It is a two-month leave that mine's taking place in October and November. And it's an occasional leave that leaders in our church uh, can take to step away from daily responsibilities of, of uh, leadership in the church and devote time to prayer, to restoration, uh, to reconnecting with family, to reconnecting with hobbies, to reconnecting with life-giving things, and uh, to imagine and dream and come back inspired and energized. And I'm having a wonderful renewal leave, and I'll share more about it when I come back from it for good around Thanksgiving. But from the very beginning, at the beginning of the year, when we were plotting out when my, when my renewal leave would take place, October and November was the perfect time, but I knew that something was going to be taking place in the midst there. You may not be familiar with it. It's called a general election. It may or may not have hit your your radar. But I knew that a general election was going to be taking place. And so earlier in the year, I, I just knew I wanted to be here with you on the Sunday following the general election. I just knew I wanted to be here with you. And, and I'm choosing my words very carefully there. It's not that I felt like I needed to come and descend from on high and, and deliver some perfect prophetic word. I wish that was it, but that's not it. I just knew I wanted to be with you. I wanted to be amongst you. I wanted to be alongside you because I knew that it would be a difficult season. I knew no matter what, it would be a difficult season for everybody. I, I just knew it would be. And I didn't know how much I would need to be with you today because I just, I really, really needed to be with you. Earlier this week on Wednesday evening, Wednesday night, I had finished putting my 35 children to bed. And I had gone out into the backyard and I was by myself. My wife was doing something else. And I had started a little fire in the fire pit. It was a beautiful night. And I was planning on doing some, uh, some reading, some reading for fun. And, and I, I wasn't able to start reading. I wasn't able to start reading. I was just by myself in that evening on Wednesday night. And of course, we know there was still tons of uncertainty happening in our political system that time. And I just had this feeling, you know, it was an emotional feeling and it was a physical feeling. Maybe you felt it in your life at a really difficult time, but do you know that feeling that you get when you've been being strong for so long and you just can't be strong anymore? You know that feeling? That's the feeling that I had on Wednesday night by myself in the backyard by the fire pit. I just, I just had that feeling and I just felt despair and I felt hopelessness and I felt frustration and, and I was praying through that and feeling it and I came to realize that the pain and the hopelessness and the frustration that I was feeling had absolutely nothing to do with the outcome of any of the races that were yet to be decided or had already been decided. My, my pain, my frustration, my despair had nothing to do with the outcome of any of those races. It had something to do that was actually much more personal to me, that's much more core to me, that's much more central to who I am. See, I'm a person who believes one thing very strongly. I believe very strongly in community. I believe very strongly that we are better together. I believe very strongly that's how God made us to be. That's the, that is a central thread of what it is to be human. I believe very strongly that we're to rely on each other, to support each other, to believe in each other, to trust each other, to love each other, to wish the best for each other. I believe that so strongly. And that's what I'm constantly doing as a father in my family. Bring us together, love each other, reconcile with each other, restore each other, care for each other, wish the best for each other, even when it's hard to do so, because Lord, it's hard sometimes. That's what I'm always doing in my family. It's what I try to do as a leader in the church, always bring us together, care for each other, love each other, support each other, wish the best for each other, hope for each other, pray for each other, be there for each other, especially when there's differences between us. 
That's what I do in the pulpit ministry constantly, trying to open eyes to our common humanity, our shared experiences, the degree to which we need each other. That's what I do in one-on-one conversations over and over and over again in ministry, trying to encourage people to love, to hope, to trust, and to believe in the best of each other. I believe that so strongly. And I have to be honest, after the last month, right, or two or more, this entire season, right, not just this week, but the whole season, it's been so hard to feel that way. I mean, it, did, did any of y'all try to watch like the network news at any point in the last couple months? All those ads, and I, I understand the psychology behind negative advertising. I understand its effectiveness. I understand that it's easier to motivate people to be against something than for something. I understand the science behind it, but the weight of that on our hearts and our souls and our emotions and our lives is so heavy. And for me, that weight came crumbling down on Wednesday night in the backyard by the fire pit. And what I felt like was no matter how any of these races are determined at a local, at a state, or at a national level, no matter what happens, I feel like I'm losing. A person who believes in unity, a person who believes in bringing people together, a person who believes in trusting others, a person who believes in the best of other people, a person who tries to share that message with the world and everyone around it, I feel like I'm losing. Where do we go from there? So, Knowing that I was going to be with you for months now, uh, I was reflecting on the scripture to lead us and guide us in our time of worship today. What does uh, does Holy Scripture have? And I kind of had paralysis by analysis. You ever have too much time and too many options to make a decision? That's where I was on finding the right scripture for this Sunday. And so I just took it out of my own hands. Those of you who are uh, particularly church fluent, you may be familiar with a concept called the lectionary. The lectionary is a prescribed cycle of readings uh, that very traditional churches sometimes use uh, that can prescribe over the course of the Christian year certain readings to be used in times of worship. They repeat on a three-year cycle and it's just, it just goes on regardless of what's happening in the world these are the lectionary choices for that day of the year and the most current lectionary that's active in the United Methodist Church world is the Revised Common Lectionary. It was developed just a little under 40 years ago and so typically when I'm picking worship I don't stick too closely to the lectionary but I check it from time to time and so I checked the lectionary and I said what does the lectionary have for the second Sunday in November 2020, right? This collection of scripture that was created 40 years ago that's international. I mean what, what does it have picked out, I wonder, for this Sunday? And of course this happened so many times in your life. The perfect texts were there. The perfect messages were there. The perfect thing that I needed to hear were there. We read those scriptures early. There's two of them. The first was our Old Testament text, our, what we call uh, the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. It was, a, it was a text from the book of Joshua. And I want to give you a little bit of background information. And I need to apologize in advance because I've been home with four kids, ages eight, six, three, and two, for the last six weeks. And no one has listened to me at all for the last month and a half. So if I go on for a long time, it's just because I'm so excited to have people listening. This text comes to us from the the book of Joshua. Now what had happened for the people of Israel, they lived in captivity in Egypt. And then through the leader and the prophet Moses, God had brought them out of captivity, out of slavery, and they had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They had been totally reliant on God, and that time of total reliance on God had changed them, had prepared them for inheriting the promised land. And the task, the work of leading the people of Israel into the promised land was passed on to Moses' successor, Joshua. And that's what's happening in the book of Joshua. It's the story of the people of Israel coming to inhabit the land that had been promised to them and given to them by God. And coming into that land was hard. It was difficult. It required miracle after miracle after miracle, intervention after intervention after intervention of the work of God to make that work possible. And they do it. And they're there. And our text today comes after 25 or 30 years of relative peace and calm. After that hard work of establishing who they were was over. And Joshua comes to the leaders of the people. And in that intervening time, people had begun to stray. 
People had begun to lose sight of their core values, their core principles, who they were, and what it meant to be the people of God. So he speaks to them from this place called Shechem, which is a location, a physical location, where multiple times God had established and renewed God's covenant, God's promises, God's relationship with God's people. Joshua speaks to these leaders. And he says, you need to choose who it is that you will worship. You need to choose what it is and who it is that you worship. Now remember, worship isn't just something that we do on a Sunday morning. Worship is not just an act of going to church. Worship is a proclamation. Worship is you saying, this is the thing that I'm building my life on. This is the thing that I'm resting my family on. This is the foundation for who I am. This is what I think will be there when everything else is gone. That's what worship is. And over and over again, particularly in the Old Testament, we're warned against the practice of idolatry. And idolatry is taking anything in the world, even good things like family or career or wealth, taking anything in the world and putting it in the place where only God belongs. If you worship anything else, that's idolatry. So the question is never, did you worship? The question is always, what are you worshiping? Joshua is speaking to a people and many of them have become complacent or they become assimilated to the world around them and they're worshiping the things that the people around them worship, something other than just their God. He says, choose what you're going to worship. As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. That was the first text pre-selected for this Sunday nearly 40 years ago. The second text was from the New Testament book of 1 Thessalonians. So Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul in that those first years after Jesus' death and resurrection is traveling. And he's meeting new people and he's teaching them about the God, the creator of all things, the one true God who loves us, cares for us, builds relationship with us. In fact, cares so much for us that God came to be alongside us in the power and presence of God's son, Jesus the Christ. Not to condemn us, but to reconcile us, restore Restore us and make us new again to promise us a life not only worth living right now but a life that will continue on eternally. Paul shared that good news and he energized those people. He formed churches. He changed their lives and then he continued on to do the same thing elsewhere. And when Paul's writing that letter what's happened in the intervening years is Paul sent somebody back to check on them. And that person came back and gave him a report and said the church in Thessalonica they have so much faith and they have so much love, but things are hard for them. They're facing challenges, they're facing difficulties. Worst of all, things aren't turning out the way they wanted. They're expecting Jesus to come back in their lifetime and some people are passing away either because of persecution or naturally. And the church is starting to lose hope. They have faith. They have love. They're losing hope. So that second scripture reading is Paul writing to them. It says, remember the promises of Jesus. Remember what Jesus said. Remember how Jesus promises you this ends. Remember how Jesus said you will never be separated from him. Right? Remember how Jesus said, where he goes, you will go also. Remember the promises of Jesus. And in today's language, in today's words, if I was counseling someone who was going through a difficult time, if I was explaining this to someone who was going through a failure in a business or in a relationship, if I was to share this news with a Christian who was struggling through an incredibly difficult time in their life, I would say it to them like this, remember, the worst thing is never the last thing. The worst thing is never the last thing. The pain, the hurt, the doubt, the frustration. Remember how this ends and how this ends is good. The worst thing is never the last thing. And Paul says that, Paul says, say that over and over and over again to encourage each other. This has been an intense season and I don't know if you found the results of the season encouraging or discouraging. I don't know if you found them encouraging or discouraging. If you live in Tarrant County, the chances are 50-50 on that. Over 800,000 vote casts in Tarrant County. The difference between them, less than the people that come to this church every Sunday. 
Either whether you found them encouraging or discouraging, the same thing is true when you leave these doors today. Step out into a world that is not only divided, but sees half of the people around them with great amount of fear and distrust. What do we do? I mean, what do we, what do we actually do? What do we actually say? How do we actually act in a world like that? What, what do we do? Has it always been like this? I don't know. I'm only 60. But it seems like it's getting harder and harder. That was supposed to be a joke, y'all. I haven't been here in a long time. <laughs> what do we actually do? I, uh, I saw an incredible study. Um, I read a newspaper article, excuse me, that, re- that referenced the study. And it was a study from a very wonky academic journal called uh, Emotion. It's, a, it's, the, it's the kind of journal that research psychologists write studies in. And they were working with some people, and they were working with a community of people uh, that were very strong in a couple of different ways. They were the kind of people who were 100% rock solid in all of their convictions with 100% certainty that they were absolutely right. That was one of the characteristics of this group of people. And the other characteristics of their test subjects were that they deeply, deeply believed that people who disagreed with them were not only wrong, but were dangerous and to be feared or eliminated. So not only did they believe with 100% certainty that they were right, people who disagreed with them were wrong and needed to be feared and eliminated. They took that group of people and they studied them. And they did something incredible. They had had them reflect and meditate on images of the starry night sky. They had them look at images of the night sky, the stars, the galaxies, They had them reflect on those images, think about the cosmos, the greatness of creation, and reflect on their place in it. Reflect on who they are. Reflect on the greatness, the grandeur, and the beauty of all of creation. Then had them retake those evaluative tools. And what they found was even after very brief times of having done those reflections, they found their own rock solid certainty that everything they believe is 100% true going down a little bit. And they saw their ability to maybe trust or believe the best in other people rising up. What do we do? Those who are encouraged, those who are discouraged, every one of us walking out to a world in need of healing, what do we do? On the screens to my side, uh, I'd ask our people, our technology wizards upstairs to bring up some pictures. If you're worshiping at home, they're gonna cover the screen for a few moments and that's just fine. I want you to look at these pictures as they come forward onto the screen. Images of the starry night sky. I want you to think about them. I want you to think about what those images communicate. I want you to think about that as just our view, our perspective on the grandeur on God's creation. Think about the God who knows all that, who made all that, who spoke all that into being, who knows knows every single atom and every single space of all of that creation, including in that you your hopes, your dreams, your fears, your doubts, your needs. The God who made all of this and all of us and loves each and every one of us, not because we're good, but because God is. So good, in fact, that God joined us, came alongside us, and God's only son not to forsake us, but to redeem us, reconcile us, and bring us close to God in a life that not only is worth living now, but extends forever. Reflect on that when I ask you the question, what do you worship? What do you worship? What do you proclaim to be the foundation of your life? You can pull those pictures down. Thank you. It's very unlikely that any of us are tempted to worship the fertility gods of any ancient Near Eastern cults like the people Joshua was speaking to. If you are tempted, don't do it. The idols that we face are much sneakier The idols that we face are sometimes things that proclaim themselves to be good or strong. Or they can be good things that aren't good for us when they become the thing that we worship instead of God. And I love what Joshua says. He doesn't just say, I will, me and my family, we will proclaim our faith in God. He doesn't just say, me and my family, we will 
uh, tell more people about God. He doesn't just say, as for me and my family, we will faithfully attend services of worship. That's not what he says. He says, as for me and my family, we will serve that God. As for me and my family, we will be about that God's business. As for me and my family and us, we will do our God's work out in the world. So when I ask you, what do we do? What comes next for us in our place? I say, don't just proclaim and worship our God. I say, serve our God. I mean, go out into this hurting world and do something that our God would love. I mean, forgive somebody. I mean, step out those doors and trust somebody. I mean, step out those doors and apologize to somebody. And maybe it's in your family. Maybe it's in your business. Maybe it's in your workplace. Maybe it's in your school. Maybe it's in your community. But it is hurting out there. Go out those doors and serve somebody. Help somebody. Love somebody. And when you run out of juice, because you will. And when you hit resistance, because you will. And when you hit ungrateful and unreceiving people, not ready to be on the other end of your love, grace, forgiveness, and respect, which you will, keep up your hope. Keep up your hope. Because your God made known to you in your Christ who has saved you, redeemed you, supports you, sustains you. Your God has promised that the worst thing ain't the last thing. That that work you do makes a difference. So let us go from this place. Let us be that voice of hope, encouragement, love, and trust in a world that desperately needs a little more good news. Amen? Let us pray. Great and loving God, great are you and greatly to be praised. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you have promised us over and over again that when we place our trust in you, our hope in you, our lives in your caring hands, that we are supported and nurtured by you even when we feel the most lost, alone, or scared. God, first and foremost, Help us be people of reconciliation. Help us be people who apologize. Help us be people who forgive. Help us be people who trust. Help us be people who reach out. Help us be people who live at our best because every moment we reflect the teachings and the spirits and the life of your son Jesus at work in ours. And it's in his name that we pray the words together that he taught us to pray. Saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. to the close of our worship service, I want to invite you to be part of this community. Uh, Reverend Lance just talked about being in a community, how important that is. And so we invite you to find your place here. And in our model of discipleship, we talk about doing plus one. So if we worship today, find something else to do. And maybe this is the week you go out and you serve. You go and you do something extra. And in our discipleship, we also have the grow, which Mike talked about on Wednesday night, or prayer meeting at nine o'clock at night. Find some way that you can go out and serve and I invite you to be part of this loving congregation whether you're online or in person we can all spend time together so I invite you now to stand and hum or sing wherever you are
together today. Uh, just want to let you know that in, and after a benediction, we are going to be led in a postlude. Then I'm going to ask you to remain seated, and our ushers are just going to help dismiss you row by row. It just minimizes the accordion effect and the amount of time that we spend together, or uh, jam together, uh, maximizing the health and safety of everyone. I'm so thankful that you joined us. I also want to let you know it's custom to kind of have a pastoral receiving line outside. I'm not going to do that today, but I am going to be waiting here up front. If any of you uh, are in need of prayer or a special conversation, know that I'm right here, and I would love to visit with you. Now, please bow your heads and receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face raise to shine upon you. And as you go out into this place, may you worship God and serve him in love, strength, faith, and hope now and every day. Amen and amen.